Hello. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, I uh, last year, of course, during the chaos, last spring during the chaos of uh, COVID, uh, I was broadcasting from home. If you happen to look at that. Uh, and what you find is that I'm going to go over some of the same stuff today uh, in doing that. And so let's see where we are, shall we, in your study guide. We are right here, Roman numeral 12. Talking about life in the, in the 18th century. Europe of this era was tied to the production of the land. The main goal of the peasantry was the constant supply of food to the populace. Harvest, once again, uncertain at best. And the farther one traveled east, the more uncertain it became. You say, well, why? What, what's the issue? Well, see, um... You're talking about between Western Europe and Eastern Europe, two different climates. Western Europe has what is called a maritime climate, at least before global warming it did. Yeah. Um, in fact, I witnessed it when I was uh, in 1989. I traveled to Europe for the first time. And we were in Europe from about June 13th to July 4th. And, you know, during that time, it rained about every other day. And it was cold and damp. A lot of the times, uh, it's a maritime climate, meaning a maritime climate has um, wet, wet, sorry, rainy, mild summers and wet, rainy, mildish winters, uh, mildish being to the cooler side. Uh, however, Eastern Europe has what is called a continental climate. Continental climate is the kind of climate you find, for example, in North and South Dakota. Yeah. Um, meaning that it's the center of a large land mass, a large continent. And in continental climates, you have more weather extremes. Hot summers without rain and cold, brutal winters where everything is frozen. And so, yeah, um, the more uncertain, that, that affected negatively the harvest. A failed harvest could easily result in death and starvation. Once again, in Europe of the 18th century, starvation was a thing. Oddly enough, rural dwellers had a harder time finding food than their urban counterparts. Even though the rural dwellers lived where the food was made, their food would be sold right out from under them uh, to more profitable city markets. Most historians believe that during the 18th century, this is one of the things you got to underline here. Maybe I should underline it for you. Most historians believe that during the 18th century, bread prices slowly but steadily rose, putting pressure on the poor and peasant population because, once again, bread was the staple crop. I mean, the staple food. Rising grain prices caused the landowners of Western Europe to exact changes in farm production that became known as the agricultural revolution. Say, so what does that mean? Well, Western landowners saw the uh, possibility of making more money because of rising grain prices. But the only way they could do that would be to change the methods of tilling the soil a.k.a. bumping the little farmer off, not killing them, although sometimes that did happen, but simply driving them off their land. And this will be called the agricultural revolution. The agricultural revolution, look, I defined it for you, changed in production and methods, which often caused revolts. Part of that, once again, was because they drove the little farmer, the small farmer, off their lands that in England, they began the hedgerow system, which later caught on in France. You say, what are hedgerows? These hedgerows, in order to, to keep cattle in a certain area, didn't build fences, they built hedgerows. And they would mound up the dirt, <coughs> okay, and then plant these hedges on the at the top. And these hedges got to be where they were very, very thick uh, and impenetrable. Fact of the matter was, in World War II, the hedgerows became a death trap for Allied soldiers pressing through uh, France. 
because you know snipers, Germans could easily conceal themselves, con could conceal uh, machine gun nests uh, in those hedgerows, and not only that, but American tanks, the M4, the so-called Sherman tanks, even had difficulty penetrating them. Uh, and so, yeah, they built these hedgerows to keep, in the old days, in the Middle Ages, people kept their cows, cattle, and sheep in kind of a central, free-range grazing area, parts or maybe all of which was owned by the lord of the manor. So what the lord of the manor did was he, he uh, sectioned them off. He put up barriers like the hedgerows that would prevent um, the poorer peasants from grazing their cattle uh, and feed, watering their cattle in various water holes and, uh, and uh, grazing fields. And that caused revolts and rebellions. These rebellions were put down by governments who were anxious to increase farm revenues. But see what the English landowners were doing, they did it because it would be more efficient they could, for example, they wanted to keep the peasants' cows out of their cow, their cow herd because the peasant cows were little scrawny things and they didn't want them interbreeding with uh, their cattle that they had spent a lot of money trying to improve the breed, <clears throat> selective breeding, you know, which is one of the methods uh, that they used. Dutch farmers had devised better and better ways to drain lands and to build dikes and to put more land under the plow. English farmers came up with almost no ideas, but took the new ideas of the Dutch and expanded upon them. Jethro Tull, let's bungle in the jungle. And of course, no, nobody gets it. What does that mean, bungle in the jungle, Miss Harden? It was a song that came out in the 70s by a guy named Jethro Tull. Um, ask your grandfather about it. So, Jethro Tull was an English farmer and researcher who utilized modern methods. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Charles Turnip Townsend utilized fertilizer. Fertilizer. Horton. Fertilizer, crop rotation, and using wheat, turnip, barley, and clover. Um, use. Yeah, both of these mean pretty much the same thing. The leguminous crops, what are leguminous crops? Leguminous crops are um, a type of crops, timothy, alfalfa, clover, peanuts is also a leguminous crop. Uh, and what leguminous crops do? Now, they didn't know it at the time, but they, they just knew that when you plant these crops in the soil, the next year the soil was more, was better more productive. What leguminous crops do is leguminous crops are able to take nitrogen out of the air. Nitrogen, as you know, makes up about 79% of all air that we breathe. Take nitrogen out of the air and put it into the ground where plants can consume it. They didn't know how that worked, but they just knew that, you know, that planting timothy and alfalfa and clover, the next year the soil would be better and use crop rotation, not planting the same crop year after year after year after year on a certain uh, crop piece of land. Robert Blakewell pioneered new methods of animal breeding. Say, what does that mean? What is animal husbandry? Did your mama, is your mama a llama? No, 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 how silly Horton. But anyway, yeah, Robert Blakewell, if you've ever watched Charlotte's Web, Okay, Charlotte's Web, the cute little story about the spider and the pig. Um, in the first part of the story, do you recall what's going to happen to Wilbur? Hmm? Wilbur's just a little baby. What's going to happen to him? And I'm sure you know that uh, the farmer, the father of the family, was headed off with Wilbur and an axe in his hand. And the little girl, I forget what her name was, says, 
what are you going to do with that axe? And he says, I'm going to kill Wilbur. Be why? Because Wilbur was a runt. It was a, he was a small pig. And the farmer did not want Wilbur, the runt, interbreeding with his larger, more desirable pigs. I mean, you know, they, they, uh, they, the 18th century English farmer learned that by selective breeding, meaning breeding only your best, most desirable animals, you could breed desirable products, such as they learn how to breed horns out of cattle. You know, for the longest time, cows have horns. But more and more, they learn how to breed, to selectively breed cows that didn't have horns until you have entire species of cattle, like the Charolais, like the Shorthorn, uh, you know, that have no horns. And some cattle were bred for dairy, some cattle were bred for meat. But yeah, Robert Blakewell. Thank you very much. In the 1700s, farmers in Europe used the open field methods of growing crops and livestock, whereby ownership of land and fields was not exactly laid out. And that's what I was talking about. English farmers began to fence in or hedge in their lands. This caused resentment, turmoil, especially from the small farmers who liked the old free field system. Uh, and yeah, what was happening here was that the economy of the marketplace, meaning that the English farmers learned they could make more money by running off the small farmer, was forcing landlords to allow their tenants to fall to the mercy of hard times. Yeah, they simply charged higher rents. They wouldn't let them water or feed their herds on in the, uh, the field like they used to. And so eventually the small farmer had to leave and they moved to the city and fortunately for the small farmer who moved to the city the real industrial age was about to kick in well i say fortunately yeah the degradation of the uh, industrial age was we'll talk about that in the second semester uh so um in eastern europe rural improvement was limited nothing in the relationship of the serfs to their lords encouraged innovation say what does that mean remember serfs are slaves and if you're a serf why would you work harder to make the lord more money you're not getting paid and so they did up until now the chief method of increasing production was to simply bring until lands into production the only real improvement in eastern europe was the introduction of maize corn and the potato. That did increase the amount of calories that could be produced on the farm. Beef and meat did not increase. Okay, let's wrap our head around a thing called demographics. I know Miss Cronin told you about demographics. Demographics, very valuable field of study, the study of population trends. In other words, what large numbers of people, I hate those lights, please. The study of what large numbers of people tend to do. If you can master demographics, you become one of the most valuable people in the business world because you can predict what large numbers of people will want. Beginning in the second quarter of the 18th century, the population of Europe, so that's from 18, I'm sorry, 1725 to 1750, the population of Europe began to grow steadily. Before, the growth had been erratic, and it had been very slow, but from 1725 to 1750, the population began to grow steadily. Oh, yes. Forgive me. I left this out. This is an important statement. Yes. The population explosion of today has beginnings in the 18th century. 
1700, and these are some stats. Do you have to remember them? No, but you have to remember the tendencies. And I would remember that thing about the second quarter of the 18th century. In 1700, there were between 100 and 120 million people living in Europe and the Ottoman Empire. By 1800, there were 190 million people, almost double. By 1850, 260 million. That kind of growth puts all sorts of economic pressure on the countryside. Causes of the growth were, look here. I'm telling you, I've seen so many questions that ask, why did the population grow in Europe at the beginning of the 18th century? And it wasn't because of an increase in the birth rate. The fact of the matter was, in France, the birth rate fell. It was because of a decline in the death rate. Okay. There were fewer wars and somewhat fewer epidemics. You didn't see the Black Plague come back anymore. Uh, hygiene and sanitation had improved somewhat. Ew. Trust me, ooh is the proper word. Better medical knowledge, once again, ooh. They at least they stopped bleeding people. Changes in the food supply with the addition of new crops like the corn and the potato. Look what it says here. Sing the praises of the potato. A single acre of potatoes could feed one peasant's family for an entire year. More children survived to adulthood and then had children of their own. You see, the population growth created new demands for food, good jobs, and services, and a new labor pool. Massive migration to the cities in search of jobs and food, because remember all those farmers, they got kicked off of their farms. They had to go somewhere, and a lot of them just went to the cities, where fortunately for them, once again, the uh, Industrial Revolution was kicking into full gear. The society and the social practices of the old regime literally outgrew the traditional bounds. In other words, in an industrial economy, the old methods of the nobility and the clergy and the peasantry, it just, it didn't fit anymore. You know, peasantry in a, an industrial society just doesn't work. All right, on the 14th. The second half of the 18th century saw the Industrial Revolution, a period of sustained economic growth. The economy of Europe had managed to expand at an almost uninterrupted pace. At considerable social cost, the industrialization made possible the production of more goods and services than ever before in history. Now at considerable social cost. We're going to talk about that more in the second semester. But when it says at considerable social cost, you're talking about in the Industrial Revolution, people jammed in together, very densely packed, very dense populations, uh, living together, living on top of each other, living in squalor, living literally in their own filth. And at great suffering. I mean, for example, let's talk about Cincinnati. In Cincinnati of the 19th century, which is the Industrial Revolution, in the 19th century, the city of Cincinnati had a population density of 100,000 people per square mile. The city of Cincinnati doesn't have a population density of 100,000 people per square mile today. And yet back then it did. Why? Because, number one, consider this, in the 19th century, the primary industry of Cincinnati was pigs processing pork. I mean, Cincinnati was once called Porkopolis. You ever wonder where the flying pig gets its name? The marathon? Yeah. And so... Everybody who worked in the pork industry, and that's what most people worked at, had to live close to the industry. And so, and what they do, they did, they would march those pigs on foot into downtown Cincinnati, herd them into stockyards where they would wait to be slaughtered. And I don't know if you've ever been around a large number of pigs. I actually have. The stench is just 
the stench is just uh, overwhelming. You know, you would not believe it's such a foul thing. And then, of course, you're talking about uh, oftentimes the peep, the pigs where it would be housed in the lowest floor of a building. The second floor, uh, you would have the slaughter house where they actually kill the pigs. And then the third floor would be the where they actually uh, process. That means cut the pig into parts, turn them into lard, that kind of thing. And then on the fourth floor, people live. Now, and remember, they don't have air conditioning. And, you know, they also don't have running water or running sewage in these cities. You see, that's the whole point. You have this this tight density of people living on top of each other. No running water, no sewer systems. And uh, I guess that works. And so, yeah, imagine all the negative aspects of living like that, aside from the stench all the time, the transmission of disease, you know. Oh, yeah, and these people work for pittances. Yeah, and so at its considerable social cost. The industrialization, though, made possible the production of more goods and services, more goods, more goods and services than ever before in history. In the long run, it, the Industrial Revolution, raised the standard of living and overcame poverty that most Europeans lived in in the 18th century. The, re the revolution, the Industrial Revolution, that is, should write that down. was caused by the demand for ordinary consumer goods like buttons, toys, china, furniture, silverware. I mean, things that people use, consumer goods and foodstuffs. People during this era had more disposable income with which to buy products. Changes of styles also re uh, re renewed demands. Tea and coffee became staples. That's odd because both tea and coffee, as well as sugar, and chocolate are all imported products and Europeans were consuming them fairly regularly. Oh yes, this is my own commentary, but note that the absence of consumer goods as well as that of civil liberties led to much of socialism's downfall in the eastern part of Europe in the 20th century. You know what? I'm going to end there. Uh, it's getting late, and we're getting, you know, we're moving on towards the end of the chapter. So, yeah, uh, today's Friday. Tonight you have your test, as well as once you finish that test, you want to start working on the LEQ. Uh, and, you know, pretty soon we'll be having a test on this chapter. And so with that, I'm going to stop sharing. Have a good night.